Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar, The Mental Health of Our Medical Profession, with former BMA President and Emeritus Professor of Mental Health and Cultural Diversity at King's College London, Professor Dinesh Bugra, CBE. Professor Bugra is joined by Dr. Jonathan Much, a UOK Doc Ambassador, and tonight they will be in conversation with UOK Doc Psychotherapist Chris Cherry. My name is Anthony and I'm a CT3 in Psychiatry in Greater Manchester, and I'm also proud to be a UOK Doc Ambassador. I'd like to thank all of you for attending tonight from across the UK, the US and beyond. And thank you to Professor Bugra and Jonathan, as well as our sponsors, Draeger UK. The purpose of this webinar is to bring together leading voices to support the mental health of healthcare professionals and to empower them to safeguard their well-being in the future. The series is presented in collab collaboration and partnership with First Responders First, an incredible initiative from Thrive Gro Global, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the CAA Foundation. For those of you who are new to us, UOK Doc is a charity funded by doctors to support the mental health and well-being of doctors. Please visit our Instagram or website to find out more. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Chris and we can get this evening started. Thanks, Anthony. Um, welcome to you both. Delighted to have you both here. Um, tonight, what I thought would be a really good thing to do is just to focus uh, and discuss burnout. I know, Dinesh, that you've got your own experience, knowledge, uh, research um, that will be very useful to dip into. Uh, and also, Johnny, as a frontline doctor, both your own reflections and thoughts about burnout, uh, your own views, and some of the ways in which you take care of yourself emotionally um, to make sure that burnout doesn't happen to you. Um, I thought it would be useful to start with, what is burnout? Let's just start with the basics, Dinesh. What, 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 when we talk about burnout, what do we, what do we mean? It's, uh, burnout is, uh, I mean, firstly, thank, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And it's a great pleasure to be here uh, to be talking about how do we look after ourselves? Because I think uh, we spend most of our working lives looking after other people. And it's really, really important. Um, I came to the um, exploration of burnout uh, about... 12 years ago when we did a study in India trying to find out uh, what happens uh, in burnout. And you know we can cover that a bit later. But burnout basically is um, emotional exhaustion. Uh, it's about mental exhaustion and physical exhaustion that uh, you feel that you're working under a lot of pressure, things that you can't change, you, you feel trapped. It's slightly different from stress because, um, you know, th this one is more about exhaustion and depersonalization that you feel somehow that you're not yourself. So you feel tired all the time, you can't concentrate and um, you find ways of avoiding. But again, I mean, you know, we will talk a bit later about the kind of double bind that we all find ourselves in that on the one hand, we want to do our best for our patients. And on the other, because we can't concentrate and we can't sort of function well, there's that tension. So that discrepancy then adds more pressure. And that's what uh, then leads to, you know, uh, professional errors, leads to personal errors, leads to accidents, you know, and we've heard tragedies of, um, doctors who've been on call while driving home have crashed the car and um, you know either hurt themselves or even died. So I think that those are the kind of um, consequences of burnout, um, which is physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion. I mean, you made an intro, the, the, the first thing you were saying about the role, the the, the, the purpose of, of, of the, the responsibilities of doctors, the, the, that, do you see that as making doctors particularly vulnerable to burnout? I think that there are, I mean, the, you know, each profession has its own problems. And again, I mean, one of the things that we were looking at, the rates of uh, 
suicide among doctors are 1.8 times those of general population. Yeah. Um, suicidal ideation is very common. Um, there's um, sense, I mean, it, it, you see higher than expected rates among lawyers and judges as well. So, it, you know, but doctors are way high. Uh, even pharmacists are 1.2 times those of uh, the general population. So there is something, and I think there are, again, if, you know, one of, one of the things that uh, we did do uh, when I was invited to take over the presidency of the British Medical Association in uh, 2018 um, in May annual meeting, one of the proposals that I put forward to the organization was that we needed to do a survey of uh, mental health and well-being of doctors and medical students. And um, on World Mental Health Day, 10th of October, 2018, uh, BMA launched the survey. So we used um, Oldenburg's um, burnout inventory, which focuses on emotional exhaustion and depersonalization. And we got about four and a, uh, four and a half thousand responses and we analyzed about 4,300, which included uh, doctors and medical students. And again, I mean, I think you need to bear in mind that there are challenges in doing online surveys. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, people who are really stressed or frustrated or otherwise might choose to express their distress that way. Or, um, you know, there, there are other uh, issues because these are not sort of face-to-face -face interviews. So, and what we found was that 80% of the sample uh, were reaching burnout levels. And what that meant was that, uh, you know, when you teased it out, women, junior doctors, and uh, senior doctors who were sort of coming up to retirement were burning out as were the staff grade and associate specialists. So there's a kind of range and you know there was a difference across specialities as well. I mean, you know, primary care, psychiatry were way higher uh, compared to others. But there's also um, one of the most frightening things we found was that one third of the sample were using alcohol or self prescriptions to deal with, you know, th these feelings of burnout. That they were not seeking help anywhere else. And also, I mean, the tragedy was and is that you know, junior doctors, particularly uh, trainees, when they asked for help, they were not getting it. And is largely, you know, the kind of six months placement in six months, he or she is going to be somebody else's problem. So I don't need to do anything kind of response. And institutions also were particularly bad at uh, providing support and providing um, information and um, therapy as needed. But equally, I think what was worrying um, partly because of the high levels of burnout and lack of access. Um, medical students were doing sort of slightly better in that the universities and medical schools were picking up and offering them support. So senior doctors, SAS doctors, junior doctors were doing pretty badly overall. Uh, so, Following on from that, we then decided to do a de qualitative um, interviews with, um, you know, not many, but 60 um, individuals kind of randomly selected from different groups to try and understand what was going on. And lots of things emerged. I mean, I think it was partly to do with the institution uh, partly to do with pressures that, you know, people who were under pressure are junior doctors and have the least amount of power to change anything or do anything. Mm -hmm. And they don't feel part of the team. They're doing shift work. They're being treated like shift workers. 
So there were kind of institutional factors <coughs> and they were also um, factors like not being supported by the team because you don't feel a part of the team and therefore you don't, um, you know, who do you go to if you're feeling under stress and nobody else, you know, wants to get involved because that means yet another thing that you have to worry about is, you know, which is a real shame because it's our responsibility as seniors in the profession to make sure that, uh, you know, trainees are being looked after because they are the future workforce. That, you know, there's no doubt about that. What, so, what, I mean, in turn, so, sorry to interrupt, but did, did, was, was that the basis on, because you set this up in 2018, is, is that right? Yes. And so preceding that, did, you'd already seen a need, an urgency to collate yeah. and get a sense of what was happening for people. Yeah. I think, this, I mean, we have known for a very long time, and there have been studies since the mid 1970s about pressures yeah. on doctors and rates of anxiety and depression, uh, substance abuse, suicidal ideation, and um, so on and so forth. But what has also been, I mean, I think the practice, the medical practice has changed dramatically in the last 50 years. Mm. And certainly there have been, um, you know, public expectations have changed and patient expectations have changed. And, you know, you're kind of sitting in a clinic and, uh, you know, seven, eight times out of 10, a new patient would appear with a printout from the web saying, I've got this condition, I need this treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of adds additional pressure. Um, and equally importantly, I think it is the, um, bar a few outstanding examples and nobody teaches you in medical school how to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, there are these kind of professional expectations that, uh, you know, and as I was saying that that double bind that on one hand, you know, doctors and medical students tell us that on the one hand, you want us to be empathic and on the other, you want us to be professional. So how do we kind of, you know, bring those two together? Yeah. And that raises some sort of interesting questions about now that there are a lot of consultations are happening online. How do you demonstrate empathy? Um, and, you know, again, as a profession, we need to come to grips with um, those kind of things. And as I said, you know, one of the things that interested me in burnout was in 2008 when I did the first study in India, looking at burnout in Indian doctors in a small uh, industrial town in North India. And the burnout there was very low. And when we kind of asked uh, the doctors at that time, and they virtually everybody was in private practice and they all <clears throat> had a degree of control who they saw, how many patients they saw, what they charged. Uh, whereas, you know, in uh, certain situations, you don't have that freedom to pick and choose who you see. Um, and, you know, the kind of expectations from the patients, their relatives, society are changing and creating much more pressure uh, than was the case earlier. Uh, I mean, Johnny, you, in terms of your own experiences of um, being a doctor, what are some of your thoughts just based on what, I mean, Dinesh has covered a lot of different areas just there, but your own thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, bur burnout, when, when you try and read up, about, read up about it online, you know, you get quotes from 25 to 75% of doctors will experience burnout at some point. But actually, I put my house on it. If you ask any of the doctors listening tonight, any of the doctors you work with in hospitals, I imagine all of them would have said, at some point, they've experienced some aspect of burnout. And I think it's a bit of a common misconception. People think burnout is you're in bed, you're physically can't move, you're emotionally, you're spiritually absolutely exhausted. However, it's not necessarily that, that end of the line. It might just be that you're doing a couple of tough months you know, in a poor rota where you're on weekends every second weekend, you're on nights every second or third week, and you're just feeling absolute physically and emotionally exhausted. And um, just speaking on a personal level, I've definitely experienced some aspects of burnout, mostly due to poor rotas. 
um, where I'm switching between the day shifts, switching to the night shifts, and not actually having that much time to really recover. Uh, and just on a personal level, I think the rota is definitely the toughest aspect for me when I felt I'd got to, you know, physical almost exhaustion stage. So that so that's the sort of physical, the the stress that comes from the physical demands. Yeah. Do you have your own? Um, um, forgot what the question was going to be. Sorry, I got distracted. But um, I Yes, that, 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 as I understand it now, you're invited to be much more, or the expectation, the, the need is for doctors to be more empathic, as well as sort of and medical encyclopedias. And I mean, Johnny, have you found more of a demand expectation? Um, I mean, I think the, I think the expectation's always been there, you know? Um, Doctors obviously have this this high bar of being very empathetic, empathetic, no matter the shift you're doing or how well or how not well you feel or how exhausted you are physically or emotionally. So I think it's always been there. I wouldn't necessarily it's it's changed for me. I wouldn't say it's got worse. It hasn't got better. I think it's just it's always been that that high bar that as a doctor you are expected to be empathetic for the patient. I mean, I, I suppose for both of you, I was just curious whether, because it's so clear that the physical demands can burn people out, but then the sense of public just generally needing people to be kind or empathic, understanding, um, whether there's a, is there a conflict there? I mean, you were just saying, Dinesh, about empathy online, um, but just generally whether empathy contributes to burnout, because if you're empathic, then you care about somebody, you're investing in them. And at the same time, you're having to deal with life and death literally all the time. How you sustain taking care of yourself while being empathic, which you know, inevitably makes you vulnerable to, to how you feel when something goes wrong or not necessarily due to your own actions, but just because you're dealing with humans, uh, bad things happen. Um, how, how do you balance that? I think that that's the million dollar question as to how do you balance that? Because I mean, I think that's what uh, the, uh, you know, kind of medical students and trainees tell us that, you know, that's how they feel that you, you know, uh, but the challenge really is for the profession to emphasize that it's not an either or thing, mm -hmm. you know, within being a professional, you can be empathic, um, you know, you can understand you know, you can walk in the patient's foot and, you know, and they can realize that you understand what they're trying to explain. Mm -hmm. It's that sense of, you know, working together. Uh, it's that, you know, how do you, um, I mean, you know, um, Johnny's in an interesting speciality because, you know, in pediatrics, you're dealing with parents much more than you know, the kind of patient directly in that empathic sense. But there, there has to be a value in communication. How do we communicate that empathy? How do we communicate that sense of understanding as a professional? And yes, of course, you need to have professional boundaries. And of course, you know, regulators, be it GMC or CQC, have got their own ideas. Uh, but from a I mean, one of the things that I used to teach medical students is that think of yourself as a patient. What would you expect from the person sitting in front of you? So it's a kind of gaining insight to see what it's like. And you know, the, the, and you know, most of my work has been in cultural psychiatry and different cultures. See. Uh, illnesses in very different ways, presentations in very different ways, yeah. um, role of doctors in very different ways. Yeah. So it, how do we, I mean, you know, um, I, I remember a um, family of a patient um, asking me my views about exorcism and what did I think that, you know, they thought that their you know, child was possessed. Yeah. And what did I think so I could have taken a very medical scientific line and said, no, 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 don't do it. But in order to keep them engaged, I had to understand why they are doing that. Yeah. 
So that's the message that we need to convey to medical students and trainees. And I mean, if you and, and then if you did understand, how does that then help? I'm, I'm sure it did, but how? Do, what? What do you then? How do you then well, utilize I'm, that? Well, for this individual, um, I think we agreed that if they wanted to go and see an exorcist, and um, you know, as long as I wasn't involved and they did not stop the medication. And they sort of said, no, no, we were not thinking of uh, stopping the medication anyway. We were going to sort of, you know, carry on, but we just feel uh, that this is the problem. And then came the killer question to me and they said, do you know any good exorcists? And so I, you know, said, okay, you know, I don't know, but let me put you in touch with the hospital chaplain. Yeah. And so whatever hospital chaplain did or did not do with them, they remained engaged in services. Uh, the patient carried on with the medication. Last I heard, had a job, had got married, had children. So, you know, one step may have contributed to all that. So it's kind of that understanding as to where patients are coming from is absolutely critical. Yeah. Are you, um, I know when we talked earlier, you talked about the mechanization of medicine. Where, where does, just say a bit more about that. I mean, one of the things that we picked up when we were uh, doing focus groups with medical students, particularly, um, and the ones who were expressing symptoms of burnout, they were very clear that, uh, you know, having um, this whole process of uh, simulation exercises, simu simulation tests. Uh, these are all, um, you know, technical in the sense that um, we know that, you know, there's an actor sitting in front of us who's being paid to present with all these symptoms or with all this uh, pain. We don't, we know that he's not really suffering. Um, and the kind of, you know, algorithmic following and the explanation was that we did not come into medicine to become technicians. Uh, we came into medicine to look after people and look after uh, individuals. So again, there's a challenge for the profession that you need to somehow bring those two slightly disparate sides together uh, that you, know, you can uh, use simulation if it's done properly, but at the same time, you know, you need to make sure that the um, students and trainees don't feel uh, that this is not real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mean, do, do, I mean, Johnny, in terms of empathy, I mean, uh, in terms of your training experience, was it, was it, uh, was, was it emphasized in the training that you did? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely say it so in, in the course that I did, uh, they were very, very heavy on empathy, on making sure you address the concerns and the ideas and the expectations of the patients that you saw. And it was fairly thorough, what we call OSCE training. So it gives you scenarios with an actor or actress um, and you're, you're supposed to demonstrate empathy and, and you'll get points for that. So I would say it's been fairly good. Uh, but, you know, as, as Dinesh said, Mine's a bit of a strange profession being paediatrics. As you know, I could be dealing with a toddler. We can say hi and bye, and then you'll have you'll have the parents. So it's a little bit different in that respect. Um, but but from, from my own training, I would say empathy has been very, very high on the list. And and do you think it the, as an additional uh, role responsibility, Johnny, do, do, do you think it 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 can exacerbate burnout? Even, even um, as, you know, I mean, essentially, it's an important, good thing to bring into your practice. But can it also contribute? I mean, I, I guess it probably can, but you know, there's just so many factors yeah. that can then contribute to to burnout. And empathy, empathy is just one of probably hundreds. Um, so yeah, I guess it can. But. but I suppose I was thinking of just the emotional challenges that when you invest in a, a relationship with your patients. Um, then you're emotionally involved and just combine that with the physical demands um the different roles that you have whether um 
where it makes people vulnerable to burnout because of those different demands, expectations. Yeah, and I definitely think um, all doctors would agree it's, it's the emotional attachment that will then, that you'll take home with you, that you'll be thinking yeah. about that night or in the coming days, weeks. Um, and it's definitely that emotional side that will contribute massively to the emotion, emotional burnout, which a lot will get in addition to the physical demand of you know, just a busy shift. So in some ways, I think the emotional part is, is almost the, the most, the, not the worst part, but you know, the most concerning part when it does come to burnout. I mean, Dinesh, you were talking about burnout being exacerbated by not really knowing where, where to turn to in terms of the environments, the trusts, and the organisations. I mean, was that part of your the importance, the reason for, for, for getting this data? Was it partly to then lobby to... Um... I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there are systemic factors that, you know, things like understaffing and rota gaps and you're being sort of constantly pushed into stepping in um, and very, you know, quite often very poor work-life balance because, you know, you do kind of long shifts and you go home and you're exhausted and you can't talk to your uh, husband, wife, partner, and, you know. And also there is kind of less time available to spend on main role. Um, you know, kind of you doing... Um, endless form filling, because that's what is expected of you. Along with that, I mean, I think there are sort of um, occupational factors in terms of, um, um, you know, there are unexpected outcomes, traumatic events. What happens if something goes wrong? Who do you go to? Who do you talk with? How do you sort of make sense um, of that, you know, in the kind of unexpected suicide, um, unexpected death, you know, injury, etc. Keeping skills up to date. I mean, medicine is changing so rapidly and so fast that, you know, how do you keep up to date? And because, um, you know, if you're feeling stressed, and there's also a kind of sense of stigma, as I was saying earlier, that uh, people feel that if I were to seek help, people will think I'm not a good enough doctor. Uh, so you avoid, so you stop people in the corridors, you have sort of conversations uh, which may be helpful, which may not be helpful. And then there are, you know, lack of breaks, not having a sort of, you know, space. Um, and again, I mean, one of the few things that um, changed in the last two years or so is that my understanding is that most um, hospitals now have junior doctors messes where, you know, junior doctors can sort of access food and uh, rest a bit. And, you know, um, as I was saying earlier, that, you know, not belonging to a team, not sort of feeling part of that kind of um, being undervalued mm. um, and demands keep sort of increasing um, and pressures keep on increasing. And, you know, um, very... I mean, in theory, all hospitals and trusts should have uh, access to occupational health. Um, but then, you know, there's all, always that fear that if I go and seek help, uh, the word would leak out that, you know, I'm going crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, in a way, that's part of why these conversations are so important, is to just normalize the, the challenges so that these things are are both taken seriously, but not over-dramatized in terms of the, the cost or the prejudice, the, the judgments on, yep. on people uh, seeking support. I mean, Johnny, do you, do you think culturally things have changed in the time that you've um, been working? Um, in just regards to the expectations? Just the, or? just the normalization of being able to talk about these things, the, the, the emotional challenges, the, the impact, the the effect that, that, that these extraordinary demands that are placed on you. Sort yeah, of I mean, I, I, def I think, um, you know, the, the stigma of mental health just in general uh, yeah. has, has definitely improved drastically in the last few years, yeah. mostly through things like, you know, celebrities coming forth. And I yeah. feel, you know, the, the medical professional as a whole was maybe affected a bit more latter than that, where, you know, now it's becoming normal to talk about mental health rather than, you know, just being resilient, carrying on, not talking about it. So I think it's the last couple of years in particular, you know, it's changed 
massively. Um, but I do feel that the medical profession as a whole was a bit late in the game um, with when it came to actually talking openly about mental health. And, and was that one of the reasons, Nesh, why you, you lobbied or, or worked so hard to get this data research? I think that there are, you know, I mean, what, what, as I said, I came to it quite late in my career, which is a, you know, real pity because I acknowledge that. And um, learning about, you know, seeing colleagues uh, developing stress, burnout, psychiatric disorders, hitting the bottle, uh, using sort of, you know, self-medication. And, you know, it's so really brought home to me that um, uh, it's really important that, uh, you know, when we are in those kind of positions, we have to make sure that people are being looked after, that, you know, uh, trusts are aware, government is aware, organizations are aware, all colleges are aware that here is an issue, that we need to do something about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to hear Johnny say about, you know, kind of teaching of empathy, but it's also important to understand how do we teach medical students and junior doctors to look after ourselves? Mm -hmm. you know, what are the kind of things that we need to be looking out mm -hmm. for? Or what are the things we ought to be doing? And we know that one size will not fit all, but there are you know, challenges that we need to be um, taking on board in terms of education, training, resources, uh, whether there's access to um, occupational health in a destigmatizing way, or uh, simple things like, you know, having access to, uh, you know, uh, resting uh, time. And I, I was kind of horrified to hear uh, a trainee tell me that uh, when she was on call, uh, she was told that even uh, by her, the manager, that even if there was nothing for her to do, she could not go and rest. She was being paid to be on night, so that meant that she had to stay awake. And to me, that's an absolutely ridiculous notion. That, I mean, would, would you see that as a more general sort of way of seeing things or, or uh, there's still individuals that, that uh, in their own way need a bit of, and need a bit of guidance? I think it, it, it sort of goes back to uh, the point about sort of team working and uh, shift yeah. working. If you're being seen as a shift worker, then you keep looking at your watch and say, right, it's five o'clock, I'm off. Um, and yet part of you as a professional wants to kind of stay and look after the patient, finish your assessment. You can't walk out in the middle of an assessment, that, you know, my time is up. Yeah. So those kinds of things need to be recognized and appreciated that, you know, people do go out of their way to look after patients under very difficult circumstances. Yeah. And that needs to be recognized Yep. acknowledged and appreciated. What are your thoughts about that, Johnny? Yeah, I, I think um, it's definitely something that isn't appreciated or recognised as well as it should be. Um, not just across doctors, but I think across every single healthcare professional working in hospitals in the community. The, the, the research, the, the data that you... That you uh, uh, collected, Dinesh, did, did that trans, did you then start to put, uh, in terms of preempting burnout, did you start to make suggestions or? Um, I, we, we did make suggestions. I mean, I think I kind of, um, as I was saying, I moved on to look at uh, burnout among medical students because mm -hmm. the other point in psychiatric disorders is that uh, three quarters of psychiatric disorders in adulthood start below the age of 24 and half start below 15. So that's a very vulnerable age group. So medical mm -hmm. students are really vulnerable to lots of you know, pressures and disorders. Mm -hmm. So we did a 12 nation survey of medical students and burnout and which is now being extended to another 25 countries. But what's really interesting is that you know, there's something in the profession that we get these very young very bright, energetic, <clears throat> enthusiastic people coming into medicine. And somehow we kind of beat any humanity out of them. Mm. So, you know, what's going on? I mean, we need to think uh, outside the box as to how we train, <clears throat> uh, how we educate. Um, and of course there are cultural differences, you know, I mean, there are 
when we ask those 12 countries and what are the pressures, why are you feeling stressed and burned out, that there were, you know, uh, financial problems in, you know, uh, the UK. Uh, we had sort of, you know, England and Wales in the sample uh, from Canada. There were sort of political issues from Hong Kong. Uh, there were parental pressures from India. So there are different things which are going on, which uh, we need to be um, aware of. And as I was saying that, you know, we need to make sure that one size doesn't fit all, that we need to modify our interventions. You know, organizational in intervention is one thing, making sure that organizations are aware, they provide services, they provide help, um, which is readily accessible and available, not that, you know, come and see me in three months time. Um, at the same time, you know, looking after one's own mental health and well-being, you know, using a number of strategies, um, making sure that there are enough resources and, you know, the kind of um, expectations of regulators um, need to sort of fit in with the cultural expectations. So it, it's a range of things that we would need to do. I mean, across the cultures, is, is there, are there strategies that um, fit all the cultures? I, th I think it, it, the thing that sort of um, fits across all the cultures is how do you look after yourself? How yeah. do you look after your own well-being? Yeah. And, you know, that will vary across cultures. In some cultures, you know, you can, um, you know, spend time by yourself. This is my time and don't bother me in that. Whereas yeah. that be seen as completely different in others. Yeah. So it is about, um, it, it's also about creating peer support systems. Yeah. Um, you know, people being able to talk that I, I feel distressed. Um, and somebody, a friend, a colleague, a team worker, doesn't matter what their speciality is, can sort of say, okay, let's go and have a cup of tea and chat about it. Yeah. I mean, I think part of these webinars is just to um, normalize how many people will feel that rather than having to uh, deny it or diminish it or ignore it, use drugs, alcohol, whatever. Uh, before it becomes so inflamed that it does turn into much more serious mental, emotional health problems. Absolutely. Um, I mean, Johnny, just your peer group or just, just the, you know, the, the, the period of time you've been working, what are some of the good strategies that you find useful? Um, I mean, I think everyone's different and it's all about finding that strategy that works for you. Um, I mean, you've obviously got healthy eating, healthy living type thing, you know, making sure you've got a well-balanced diet. You're not having 20 coffees a day. You're not having 20 glasses of whiskey at night. Um, and for me personally, I think exercise has been an absolute pillar in, uh, in preventing burnout for me anyway. Um, I could just be going for a run, you know, doing weights, you know, doing some cardio session by watching a YouTube video. Any sort of exercise, I think, just brings you back down to earth. It, you know, it, it neutralizes and, and eases your mind. You know, it makes you makes you feel much better. Um, it also gives you a lot more energy in the long run. So you're less likely to have a, a physical burnout if you are going to have a fairly healthy way of living. Um, so I, I'll say that's my main message: is exercise, and also I think just everything, everything in moderation as well. Um, I know one of the common. Um suggestions or, or thoughts about good mental health is, is, is the importance of teams and the communication between, within teams and the leadership of a, of a team. I mean, yeah, I, I think if you've, if you've got a supportive community, whether that's uh, a husband or wife or, or partner that you can talk to, whether that's someone at work or whether that's just a friend, as long as you've got them to speak to and to speak about your stresses, you know, bounce information off from them, I think that's really, really important. Um, and, and just just one other thing, I think um, when it comes to shift work, I think um, get, getting appropriate sleep hygiene and being able to adjust between shift work is probably one of the most important aspects to prevent the physical aspect of burnout. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to do shift work unless, you know, you 
you know, you, you do a kind of community like job um, and, and actually nailing that in the head early on when you're doing these type of shifts would really make a big difference long run in preventing any, any sort of burnout when it's going to happen because most people will do shift work. Most people will get absolutely exhausted by it. Most people won't sleep that well after nights. They won't adjust that well, but there's loads and loads of help online in your trusts. Um, I'm sure if you chat with other medical friends and just actually having to adjust between a day and a night shift type job. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dinesh, would you, uh, in five years time, let's say, how would you like to see, what would you like to have seen happen? I mean, in this country, what would you like to, to actively see change or? I, I mean, I would certainly, I mean, as we were sort of saying earlier that, um, you know, there's uh, more and more people are coming forward with, um, you know, stress and mental health problems and uh, mental illnesses and so on and so forth. And this kind of stigma is reducing. Mm. So hopefully there would come a time when it would be okay for, you know, uh, people to talk about um, their mental illness in the same way that people talk about cancer and other illnesses. Um, my fantasy would be that each hospital will have <laughs> facilities for um, medical students, trainees, and all healthcare staff as a kind of moral and ethical obligation uh, ease of access to occupational health, uh, supportive interventions, not sort of criticism that, you know, you've been kind of, you know, off and uh, you're not answering your bleeps or trying to find out why people are not answering their phone calls and um, helping them to overcome that um, uh, difficulty in seeking help. And one of the models in uh, America has been, and you know, we use in psychiatry here is uh, balance rounds where people, you know, get together once a week and you just kind of discuss uh, patients. And within that, you can get support and whatever else is going on. And peer group is also aware that, you know, something is going on. And in America, mm -hmm. they do some, something called Schwartz rounds, so which is multidisciplinary and, you know, it's a uh, every week you get together for an hour or so, talk about <clears throat> patients and talk about each other and talk about your own uh, feelings and uh, stresses and uh, so on and so forth. So my fantasy would be that um, there will be a recognition at the government policy regulator level. There would be resources available at institutional level and medical schools will take responsibility to include exactly what um, Johnny has been saying. How do you learn how to look after yourself? You know, if your partner is not um, in medicine, then this, you know, communication would have to be a very different kind. Uh, so how do you communicate those kind of stresses? How do you deal with that? So, and then at an individual level, we'll all be sort of so self-aware of, um, you know, particularly uh, looking after ourselves and, you know, physical exercises, one, yoga, meditation, um, you know, listening to music, um, doing things which give you pleasure, keeping time for yourself and your employer making sure that you have time for yourself rather than saying, oh, we need you come and, you know, fill in yet another rota gap that we can't fill. I wanted to give you an opportunity to just uh, reference Doc Health because that seems quite a valuable resource. Um, Doc Health is a uh, charity which I chair as uh, jointly funded by the British Medical Association and Royal Medical Benevolent Fund, and it's for uh, doctors. They can you know ring in and see just like you know um, um, you know you okay doctors kind of providing um, psychotherapy for a fixed number of sessions, group work and so on and so forth. And you don't need to be, you don't have to be a member of the BMA to access those. Uh, so you can just access the BMA website and um, ping in an email and somebody will get back. Are you seeing uh, 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 the rate of the use of that increasing? The, the, uh, yes, certainly I have been involved since um, last year and 
um, we were getting about um, 100 and something referrals a year, but it's more than doubled. And particularly after the last lockdown, um, it trebled and you know, we are now kind of uh, in the process of appointing more therapists to uh, deliver those services. And I think th th this is again, a potentially worrisome time with the second lockdown in England and you know, the consequences thereof. Yeah. Uh, the, you, you know, again, um, you know, not being able to see friends on, you know, again, back to uh, empathy on Zoom. Uh, so, you know, how, how do we sort of convey that, that I'm feeling stressed? How do you pick up the signals? How do you kind of convince me that yes, things would be okay? So I think my message to uh, medical students, trainees, and anybody who's listening in is one, is that have fun in whatever you are doing. And if you're not having fun, there is something wrong, then change something. And I'm, I'm a great believer in that, you know, even when you're a consultant, uh, every five to seven years, try and change something in your job plan mm -hmm. uh, so that it kind of brings in a different enthusiasm, whether you in include teaching, policy work, research, um, you know, family therapies or whatever, it's just kind of something different every few years uh, will freshen people up. Yeah, so just presumably, uh, yes, keeping yourself fresh, keeping yourself stimulated, new, new challenges that, that, that are good for your emotional, mental well-being. Just, so Doc Health, so if you phone, if you phone the, and we'll put up the details, but if you phone, then what happens? You talk to uh, someone who... Yeah, uh, somebody will get back to you, or you know, if they're not there the, within 24 hours, somebody will get back and uh, they will then... I um, mean, you know, these days, uh, a lot of therapy is being done um, online or, you know, uh, video. So they, you know, offer depending upon what's needed. And, you know, if you are in sort of, again, financial problems, then um, uh, Royal Medical Benevolent Fund uh, has sort of bursaries and can offer financial assistance. And is it, is it short term? Is it a particular model? Uh, it, it's uh, six to 12 sessions, but you know, there have been individuals who've been um, on, you know, taken on for longer term uh, work, but it's, it's very kind of um, supportive, exploratory uh, piece of work. Brilliant, brilliant. Johnny, do you, I mean, we're gonna go to questions and answers in a minute, but Johnny, have you got some final thoughts before we do that? Any, any fun thoughts? Final thoughts. Final thoughts. <laughs> um, yeah, fun thought. Um, so yeah, yeah, final thoughts. Sorry, I think um, just what Dinesh has said. Um, I think burnout is is very very common in our profession. Sadly, um, I think it is cure is much be prevention is much better than cure. So yeah. if we're able to, you know, make medical students, make junior doctors aware of the signs of burnout and how to prevent it from an early stage in their career, I think you'd have huge impacts, not only to them, but to the NHS as well, just to prevent medical burnout. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that'll probably be my final thought really. And to just make sure everyone reads up in it, make sure everyone has their, their own strategy to prevent burnout and make sure you recognize the signs of burnout before it's a bit too late. No, absolutely. Um, you know, it's kind of, um, um, I mean, I, when I know that I've got a sort of stressful, very busy week coming, I'm going to make sure that I've got a sort of, uh, you know, in those happy days before lockdown and before COVID, that, you know, you're going to set aside a couple of hours, that's my time to go into a bookshop, browse, you know, buy books. That's kind of my um, gu guilty pleasure. <laughs> uh, uh, Anthony. Are you able to come online and... Um, uh... Hello. Hi. So we've got some uh, questions from the audience. I just thought I'd um, start off with saying, actually, where I, I work today, we actually got two sofa beds delivered as part of our rest facilities. 
And we also have Schwartz rounds as well. So some of these things are implemented in some trusts. And was, that, quite, was, that, you know. was, that, um, was that quite easy? Who organized that? Who, who arranged that? So the trust signed the BMA Rest and Facilities Charter. Right. And um, it was taken to our junior doctors forum and we discussed kind of what rest facilities we thought were needed. And the trust has agreed to them. And we've been moved, moved into an office and there's some space where you can rest overnight. I mean, that was fairly easy to lobby for. To um, it's taken two years, so I wouldn't say it was fairly easy. But um, what, what, so, what what did you come up against? And because that's a long time. So um, we come up against an attitude that you shouldn't sleep on night shifts. That's a that's a big, really big entrenched attitude. There's a lot of lack of understanding that, unlike kind of some of the other staff that work nights, so the nurses, for example. We don't have any protected break time. So normally on a ward, um, a nurse would have a break off the ward um, and somebody else would take over that responsibility. If there's one on-call doctor, which is often the case in psychiatry, you can be called at whatever time. It doesn't matter whether you're having your lunch at three in the morning, you can still be called and still have to go to an emergency. So uh, there's, there's not very much recognition that that in itself is quite stressful, um, not having that period where you have a break. Um, I think often there isn't the the hospitals aren't designed necessarily to have these facilities. I mean, both me and Johnny trained at uh, the Norfolk and Norwich, which has actually quite a, a nice um, doctor's mess. But some of the hospitals I've worked at, I've had a doctor's mess mess that's kind of half a mile away down the road that you wouldn't go to at night because it'd be dangerous. So it's not even thought of in the design process of a hospital that they would need rest facilities for any staff. I've worked on wards that don't even have staff rooms for the ward staff that work there. I mean, it's like nobody's ever thought of it, basically. So it's a shock when we bring it up as an issue. Just, just to top your sofa bed, my last trust got donated a, a vibrating massage chair. Um, <laughs> but it's for the entire trusts, so including nurses, doctors, and you had to book a slot. And it was booked up for weeks. So I never got to try this massage chair. I wonder how COVID secure that is. <laughs> Um, in fact, so, some parts of the trust I work in, we actually have a doctor's flat, um, which has a bed in. And I think that in psychiatry, they actually used to have that quite a lot. But it, it, with reorganisations, they go um, because people maybe don't see the value of them um, or, or don't kind of understand why would why would they need them, potentially, I think is sometimes the attitude. Um, but and, and, and then the, um, sorry, the, what, what's that um, that discussion the sort of model called again? The, short, the Schwartz, Schwartz round. round. Schwartz round and Ballant uh, round. So, is, that, is that quite yeah. new, Anthony, in your so, that um, been around for a while? Ballant introduced um, Ballant groups to general practitioners in London, I think in the 1960s, maybe the 1950s. Okay. And in psychiatry, it's a uh, compulsory part of our training. Right. In the our initial stages of training, we attend a session every week where we discuss kind of relationship with the patient, how the patient has perhaps made us feel, how um, perhaps the patient's affected the dynamic on the ward. Um, and so it's a very normal part of our training for us. Right. And we always encourage uh, other doctors who are in psychiatry, so GP trainees and foundation doctors to attend. Um, some places are, oh, I'm sorry, I've lost my camera. Some places are encouraging and rolling it out to uh, non-psychiatry settings as well. So. I think there's some pilot schemes of psychiatry trainees running it for uh, ITU doctors in the Northwest. Right, right. So what are some of the, give us some of the questions that have come. Okay, so my camera's totally stopped, so I'll just start reading. Um, so Dinesh, what is your, your advice for future leaders in the medical world to support their team's mental health? How important is leadership in making a positive change? I think it's, uh, I mean, I, I, you kind of illustrated it beautifully that it took two years to get a sofa bed. Um, you know, why should it take two years? I mean, it's, you know, <clears throat> basic understanding. So leadership at that level has to, you know, make sure that, um, you know, people understand that, you know, doctors don't have um, designated breaks. So, you know, if you're on night, then you know you can get sort of 15 minutes of you know shut eye and you move on. So it is 
leadership needs to i mean it, it the process has to be recognized by the employers that here are issues that we need to address and leaders medical directors clinical directors they need to take that on board that you know communicate the needs to the uh, bosses and make sure that you know if they've signed the charter they have to deliver um, similarly i think um, as leaders of the royal colleges regulators they also need to make sure that medical force of the future is well equipped to look after their own mental health and well-being before being let loose um and you know making sure that uh, the organizational pressures are reduced and then you know there are kind of cultural factors within the institution the culture of the institution uh, needs to change and that can come from the leadership and uh, the top were you and I, I know at the beginning of our conversation you were talking about three specific groups it was women uh, old, uh, older um, junior doctors and those who were uh, coming up to retirement and and the specific reasons for those three groups that I mean I presume I, they've all got different I mean, I think women do have it uh, much more difficult in terms of kind of um, family expectations and expectations from um, the work and increasingly, and I think some medical student as uh, schools now have 60% uh, female medical students. So th that may be another kind of reflection of, um, and again, uh, the, Junior doctors, uh, particularly, you know, they that was largely because they they're not sort of uh, you know feeling part of the team. They don't belong, um, and not having that kind of uh, <clears throat> repo. And you know, I, I I don't want to sort of bang on about uh, good old fashioned days, but. As Anthony said, that you know, psychiatric hospitals used to have a doctor's mess, where you had sort of hot meals and trolley, and you kind of uh, consultants and junior doctors, and everybody sat together and had a meal. So kind of informally, you chatted about patients that you were worried about, things that were going um, awry, and you know, that, those were all taken away in you know the name of equality. That uh, you know, so. Now you have canteens where there's staff and patients and their families, so you can't really talk uh, about confidential things. So that kind of further sense of um, isolation and alienation, and not being recognised as you know or appreciated, the sense of uh, alienation further contributes to that. And I mean, I think the staff grade were and again you know they were sort of nine to fivers shift work um not being appreciated and just being seen as a pair of hands so i think that there are a whole host of um factors from institutional to uh culture personal socio-cultural lack of support uh pressures in terms of um kind of expectations and uh, duty hours and um, as you know, we were hearing earlier about sort of you know sleep hygiene. When you're doing shifts from day to night and night to day, how do you you know manage those and how do you um, pull that all together? I mean, one of the one of the um, when when you talk about belonging, it, it's one of the common sort of themes discussions that we've been having really, and the importance of leadership. Do, do you find the leadership band? Uh, are more specifically uh, uh, hostile or skeptical? Where no, that... I think it, it's neither hostility nor skepticism. I think it's mm -hmm. ignorance in a way that here is a problem. Um, the, the ignorance about the importance of... Ignorance of recognizing that, you know, burnout is a major problem. Right. Uh, that it can affect anyone, not only the kind of, you know, 
weak or the feeble as people sort of stereotype that you don't have a moral spine and therefore you're feeling like this. That's absolutely untrue. And a kind of, um, and even when you have awareness, sometimes feeling trapped by uh, institutional managerial restrictions of what you can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. what, what, what sort of managerial restrictions? The, the, the time, the, the space for, for attending to that? I, I think it, it, it's more about, you know, why should it take two years to get a sofa bed? I mean, I think it involves NHS providers, so that takes a long time to get anything for exactly. them. <laughs> it is that you haven't filled in the right forms. <laughs> or if you have, you know, the date is in American style, not in British style. <laughs> yeah. where, where are those sofa beds going to be? Oh, it's not an ideal situation. They are actually next to the main junior doctor's office. There's two small offices off yes. the junior doctor's office, and they're there. So... If you wanted to rest because you had a terrible night shift, it yes. would be quite noisy. So they're not ideal, but it's better than having a chair like you had before. I'm, I'm always interested in the detail and how, so the, 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 the sofas, the, the, the linens, the, 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 the duvet, the, the pillows and so forth, who's going to look, who's going to attend and keep an eye on all of that stuff? So I don't think they've really thought of that yet. So in some places I worked, they, ha they had um, somebody who just changed the bed for you. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, I suspect we'll have to return them to the laundry, and I think that'll be it. Yeah, I mean, I or think perhaps take a sleeping bag. <laughs> but it's also, I mean, going back to the institutional points. I mean, you know, there is increasing litigation. Uh, there is massive reduction in number of beds across uh, the NHS. So there's more and more pressure. Uh, so those kind of structural. Uh, issues need to be dealt with at leadership levels that you know we can't keep cutting beds mm -hmm. and so, so one of the uh, kind of attached to what we've talked about was what would your ideal curriculum for medical students be in terms of their well-being ah now you're getting me onto my hobby horse <laughs> <laughs> I, I would start teaching of uh, psychiatry and psychology from day one, not in the fifth year, uh, because that would mean that you understand the pressures that you know patients are under. And one of the big tragedies, certainly um, in the Western medicine, has been this kind of Cartesian mind-body dualism, that as if mind and body are two completely separate things and they don't talk to each other. So, you know, bringing them together that, you know, mind affects body affects mind. These are affected by external factors, social determinants, uh, you know, poverty, unemployment, you know, lack of green spaces, overcrowding, etc. And part of the challenge for, you know, nobody taught us, you know, I mean, I think one of the advantages of coming from India was that in our internship, we did three months of preventive and social medicine, but nobody talked about mental health in that. So you talked about infections and inoculations and, you know, uh, et cetera. So bringing that forward and teaching medical students to be advocate for our patients. We don't know how to do it. We don't know how to sort of go to the policymakers and say, you know, this is what's needed. So we need to be able to speak on behalf of our patients, advocate for them. So learning how to do that and making, again, nobody teaches us to have fun. I guess some of that's about how, trying to help us have more agency as well, because we have a lot of responsibility without yep. much control over anything. It's very strange. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I've got, Another question, this is quite topical, I guess. Um, so one of the attendees has said that a junior doctor has recently been reported to the General Medical Council for refusing to work in conditions um, where they had inadequate PPE. Um, and they said they don't know the outcome of this, but they felt it was quite chilling that the organisational focus was on um, a doctor refusing to work because they felt they were unsafe, whereas the organisation actually talks a lot about junior doctors' well-being. 
Yeah. Um, and the kind of finding those two quite hard to marry up the fact that that you know there's this focus on well-being but also this kind of punitive measures and they've gone on to say some trust manages quite well but others seem to be kind of forcing junior officers to do certain things they maybe don't feel safe doing yeah no i, th I think that that kind of proves the point that i was making earlier in that um, you know in the hierarchy junior doctors are kind of you know pretty low with the least amount of power but maximum amount of pressure because quite often they are in the front line they're doing assessments, they're making judgments, and yet um, there's an um, expectation that everything would be done right. And, you know, without going into sort of specific uh, cases or issues, I mean, I think the challenge for the profession as a whole is, again, this is about advocacy. How do we advocate for junior doctors? How do we support them? How do we create those kind of peer support networks um, where, you know, trainees don't feel abandoned. They don't feel that they're just a pair of hands. Um, so it, it's working together, you know, with the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, with the British Medical Association, with the Medical Schools Council, um, you know, and then going to the regulators, whether it's CQC or GMC, to try and create a network of interventions and support. And this is kind of a totally different kind of question. Um, one of the, the attendees has asked about any legal implications of um, a medical doctor who's diagnosed with a mental disorder. Um, kind of, are, are there any legal barriers to practicing medicine? Um, not that I am aware of. Um, they, I mean, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a scheme within the NHS which actually encouraged appointment bodies to um, have positive discrimination for people who had had mental illness and appointing them. And I was on a panel where a consultant who admitted to uh, using drugs, uh, but, you know, was off them, um, was appointed to a consultant post. So, I mean, in some ways, you know, um, such individuals can be quite, um, they've been in the patient's shoes. Yeah. Whether they want to sort of share that story or not is a different matter, yeah. but at least they have the, again, empathy. Um, so it, it's, again, something that the, you know, medical uh, profession as a whole needs to look at. That's the, the, the paradox of, or in some ways, the paradox of having stumbled yourself and being able to acknowledge it and recognize it does, uh, uh, if it's resolved, does make you a better practitioner. It just yeah. does. Yeah. And then it makes you a better advocate. Yeah. Yeah. And so in, in the field of kind of well being, there's been a coalition, uh, there's been an emergence of non profit charities and for-profit companies that have developed over the past six to 12 months. Do you think a coalition should be formed for all these separate entities that are doing something slightly different, but with a similar goal? I always maintain that there is enough misery in the world that we should not be fighting each other. That, you know, we should be working together. There are different groups have different mm -hmm. skills, different things to offer. Uh, so you, you're actually enriching the menu that people can um, choose from according to their need. So it is um, helpful to have a formal, informal coalition uh, where individuals can be, uh, can access things that they need. That's a very good answer. <laughs> Sorry? That's a very good answer. <laughs> and we've got another question here, which I think is quite an interesting question. Um, doctors, when away from the confines of the hospital walls, tend to be very pleasant people. But inside the hospital wards, seniors and peers can often um, have some of the most unpleasant behaviour you'll ever meet. Um, why is that? And why is it acceptable? It's not acceptable at all. I mean, I think why is it is a different question. And that is because, again, 
it goes back to um, that quite often doctors are put in a position where they can't do the job that they were trained to or they were expecting to do uh, because you know there are different um, kind of expectations and you know um, when I came back after finishing my term as president of the Royal College. Uh, the manager was delighted, and you know, um, because while I was doing three days, four days a week, in um, I had stopped seeing new patients. I was just seeing follow-ups because you know it's kind of uh, easier to do that way. And the manager, you know, said, "Okay, can we, you know, book patients?" And you know, can you give us access to your diary? I said, yes, fine, here it is. And the question was, how many patients, uh, new patients would you start in, within a day? So, you know, okay, uh, 50 minute hour, six, seven, and the manager's jaw fell. You need two hours with each patient. And I said, why? because one hour to see the patient and one hour to fill in all the assessment forms. And I sort of said, then, do you think that's very good use of my very expensive times? You know, I type with two fingers. It'll take me a long time. So why, I can do the assessments, but why can't the clinical mm -hmm. uh, administrator, clinic administrator can, you know, enter the data? Oh, no, 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 we need 95% compliance with CQC and it has to be done by clinicians. So what would your response be if they can't see the value of what you are good at and they're expecting you to do things which you're not very good at? How does it make you feel as a clinician? Grumpy. So it, it, you can see why people lose the will to live in that sense. Um, how people feel frustrated and angry and, um, you know, and then you just kind of get into this frame of mind, uh, which is not conducive to your mental health and well-being. I think we've got time for one more question, if we that's possible. Yeah, I think this one's for Johnny, actually. So patient relationships are cited as the key determinant of doctors' mental health. Uh, Johnny, in paediatrics, you have to deal with both the child and the parent relationship. Uh, what is your advice for managing these incredibly sensitive relationships effectively, partic particularly if you're stressed yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, I, there's definitely some stressful times where I've had to deal with a very demanding parents and then some four-year-old who's got ADHD and running around the room. Um, well, I, I think the advice would just be the same for any any tricky consultation um, where, you know, I think it, as long as you basically understand what the parents or the patient want at the consultation and, you know, you address that effectively in, in, a, in a cool, calm and collected manner, um, despite it being 4 a.m. and you being stressed, that's probably just the most important area. Um, I, th I think in any situation, even if you are incredibly stressed, sometimes just even taking a 10 minute break or breather before you start a new consultation with a family is, is always really, really important. Yeah, and setting time aside. Yeah, yeah, Don't definitely. Be <clears throat> I think that's actually all we've got questions wise. So we've finished on time, I think. Uh, I mean, that's an incredibly rich, valuable, um, conversation you've given us a lot to both absorb and think about reflect on do, do you have any final thoughts uh, Dinesh always have fun if you're not having fun you're doing something wrong yeah on on your deathbed you're not going to look back and say I wish I had worked more there's something about being able to just enjoy your 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 skills your abilities your your commitment to the work really absolutely absolutely um, it'd be a, it would be a delight to be able to get you back on again sometime, Dinesh, with some other... My pleasure. Thank you. It'd be wonderful. Thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight. And Johnny and Anthony, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take thank care. Thank you. Thanks, Dinesh. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye.